You write for INTI L0 IN plus plus I every day. You assume it's fast. It's not. We're about to show you how this one line of code, or rather how you use it, is secretly sabotaging your application's performance. The for loop is the single most fundamental building block of computation. It is the workhorse of everything we do, from calculating a sum, to processing an image, to rendering a video game world. It is the first complex structure we learn as programmers, and we type it out hundreds of times a day on pure muscle memory. We think of it as a solved problem, an atomic unit of work whose performance is a given. This assumption is not just wrong, it's a trap, a single, innocent-looking loop, written in a way that seems perfectly logical, can be 100 times slower than an almost identical alternative. This isn't about clever algorithms or fancy compiler tricks. It is about a single, fundamental concept of computer architecture that is rarely taught but has multi-billion dollar consequences. The stakes are the performance of every single piece of software you write. The difference between a responsive application and a sluggish, unusable one often comes down to understanding the invisible wall being fought between your code and your computer's memory system. A war that is won or lost inside your most basic loops. To understand this performance trap, we must first visualize the architecture of a modern computer. At the top, you have the CPU core, an engine of immense power capable of executing billions of instruction per second. It has a tiny number of registers, which are the fastest memory in the universe. But this engine is constantly hungry for data, and it cannot be fed directly from your main system RAM. The speed difference is astronomical. Asking a modern CPU to wait for data from main memory is like asking a Formula One driver to commute to work on a bicycle. It's a catastrophic waste of potential. You can almost feel the processor's frustration. It's powerful execution units sitting idle, stalled, waiting for the data it needs to do its job. To bridge this enormous gap, architects created the memory hierarchy. Between the CPU and the slow, vast ocean of main memory, they built a series of smaller, faster pools of memory called caches. You have the level one cache, tiny and incredibly fast. Then level two, a bit bigger and a bit slower. Then level three, bigger and slower still. The golden rule of performance is to keep the data your CPU needs in the L1 cache at all times. How does the system decide what data gets to live in this prime real estate? The mechanism is the cache line. When your program requests a single byte of data from memory, the hardware doesn't just fetch that one byte. That would be wildly inefficient. Instead, it fetches a contiguous 64-byte block of memory that contains the byte you asked for. This block is a cache line. The feeling is like going to a library for a single word and being forced to check out the entire paragraph it belongs to. This scene seems wasteful, but it's based on a brilliant observation about how programs work. A principle called locality of reference. The idea is that if you access a piece of data, you are very likely to access its immediate neighbors soon after. By fetching the whole neighborhood at once, the cache is betting on your future needs. The mistake, the one that kills performance, is writing code that breaks this bet. Let's make this concrete with a common task, iterating over a two-dimensional array or a matrix. Imagine a 10,000 by 10,000 grid of pixels for an image or a grid of values for a scientific simulation. 
in C or C++. This grid is stored in memory in what's called row major order. This means the first row is laid out contiguously in memory, followed immediately by the second row, and so on. The byte for grid comes right after grid. The byte for grid comes right after grid. 9999. It's one long continuous ribbon of data. Now let's write a loop to process this grid. The logical way is to iterate through each row, and for each row, iterate through each column. This looks like for R, it shall 0 to 1000. For CC, it shall 0 to 1000. Process grid. Consider what happens on the first access to grid. The CPU requests that byte, but the memory controller fetches the entire 64-byte cache line around it. This means grid, through roughly grid, assuming four-byte integers, are all loaded into the super-fast L1 cache at once. When our inner loop moves to grid, the data is already there. It's a cache hit. The same is true for the next several iterations. We are gliding effortlessly across that cache line using the free data that was fetched for us. This is perfect spatial locality. We are working with the hardware. Now, let's make one tiny change. Let's flip the loops. We'll iterate through each column, and for each column, iterate through each row. The code looks almost identical. For C, it's got zero to one and thousand, for a e those zero to one thousand and process grid. It's logically the same. We touch every element. But to the hardware, it's a declaration of war. Our first access is to grid. A cache line is fetched. Our very next access is to grid. In memory, this address is ten thousand elements away from the first. It is guaranteed to be in a completely different cache line. This triggers another expensive trip to main memory. Then we access grid, which is another 10,000 elements away, another cache miss. We are making these massive disjointed leaps across memory. You can feel the jarring, stuttering rhythm of the execution, a constant stop and go as the CPU is perpetually starved for data. We are hitting a cache miss on almost every single memory access. For every single element, we are fetching a 64-byte cache line and then using only one 4-byte integer from it, throwing the rest away. The result is a performance catastrophe. The number one mistake isn't a syntactic error in the for loop itself. It's writing a loop that accesses memory in a pattern that fights the fundamental principles of the memory hierarchy. The hook, blaming the for loop line, was a deliberate misdirection. The line is fine. The crime is in how its logic maps to the physical layout of your data. When we benchmark these two seemingly identical loops, the result is shocking. The row major traversal is a flat, low line on the performance graph, finishing in milliseconds. The column major traversal is a horrifying spike, taking seconds or even minutes, a hundred or a thousand times slower. The hardware is the same. The algorithm is the same. The only difference is the data access pattern. This is not some obscure academic concept. This is the root cause of performance problems in countless professional applications. It affects image processing, scientific computing, game development, database engines, anything that processes large blocks of data. The principle is universal. Structure your loops to access data sequentially, to walk through memory in a straight line. This maximizes cache hits and unleashes the full power 
of your processor. The fallout from ignoring this is immense, measured in wasted CPU cycles, sluggish user interfaces, and massive server costs. Understanding the memory hierarchy and principles like spatial locality is not an optional extra for a programmer. It is the absolute foundation of writing high-performance code. So the next time you write a nested loop, stop and think. Visualize how your data is laid out in memory. Are you walking with it or are you fighting against it? Your processor is begging you to make the right choice. If you want to stop guessing about performance and start engineering it with precision, consider following for more truths about how your code really runs on the silicon.